This celebration video is going to be 20 lists of five. That is 20 different lists of five things, five items. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today is a very special day. It marks the five year anniversary of this channel. So some of you have been watching now for five years and I really, really appreciate that. For all of you, I seriously appreciate you joining in with me as I share my love of reading and share with you different books that I've come across that I feel deserve more readership and also sharing old favorites, new favorites. I've so enjoyed meeting so many of you, getting to know a lot of you more and more, getting fantastic book recommendations. Thank you to all of the different publishers out there who have made contact with me now. So many great publishers, Two Lines Press, Two Dollar Radio, New Directions, NYRB, Transit Books, many, many, many university presses, OR Books, Ferris Strauss and Giroux, Corona Samizdat, Archipelago, Sublunary Editions, First to Knock. You know, when I was thinking about this video, I thought, Chris, don't start naming names either of people or of publishers because you're inevitably going to leave someone out. So I certainly do apologize if you don't hear your name mentioned at all or as a publisher, agent, publicity director, an author, it in no way implies or connotes what I think of you or where you stand in some sort of imaginary ranking. As with all lists, they are always incomplete, highly subjective. Early on, I also told myself I would never do lists for this reason because normally a list only invites people to tell you everything that you left out, which can often be a good thing, especially when it helps you discover things that you really shouldn't have left out. So I appreciate all of the people, again, who have brought so much attention to so many different authors and books and publishers that I didn't know before starting this channel. This celebration video is going to be 20 lists of five. That is 20 different lists of five things, five items. I have prepared a celebratory affogato. And if you'd like to pause the video and make your coffee drink of choice and join in with me, that'd be great. First, I would like to note that this channel did indeed officially start on June 4th, 2019. My very first video was fittingly and maybe prophetically Novel Explosives by Jim Gower. That time, I had no idea who Jim Gower was. I had never talked to him. I had never met or talked to Michael Silverblatt or anybody at all. No contact with publishers, editors, certainly not authors, other book people at all. I was very much just a solitary reader. And it just so happened that Novel Explosives was brought to my attention by hearing the interview with Michael Silverblatt and Jim Gower on Bookworm. That compelled me to go get the book and then reading the book sort of finally tipped me over into creating this channel. So it had to be the first book. As many of you know, I would go on to go to Los Angeles, meet Jim Gower at his home, meet Michael Silverblatt in his home, and then write the afterword to the second edition of Novel Explosives. Just really incredible circumstances. All right, so let's kick this video off with 20 lists of five. The very first is five things that I would like to improve on the channel. Number one is, of course, pronunciation. I am trying to do a lot better with this for my Tale of Genji video. I literally did Zoom sessions with a friend of mine to nail down the Japanese pronunciations. And in other videos, I'm doing similar things, getting some input on uh, nailing down the pronunciations. But then, of course, besides just foreign languages, 
I have been a solitary reader for so long, and I actually stopped going to public school after the ninth grade, and I pitched this online high school to my parents when I was 14. They agreed to let me do it as long as I could stay on top of it on my own, and I ended up doing 10th, 11th, and 12th grade through snail mail back then and finishing it all in one year and then went to college early. But I did a lot of my first college on my own. But all that to say that for the majority of my learning and reading, I've done it very much in isolation, such that I haven't heard words that appear in literature pronounced. And so a lot of my pronunciations have for a long time been very much my own. I recognize the words, I know their meanings from doing a lot of reading, but I never really paid attention to the pronunciation because it was never really important to me as a silent and solitary reader. Now that I've started the channel, it's it's becoming more and more apparent that, oh man, <laughs> I've really made a lot of incorrect assumptions on pronunciation. So I am working on that. And thank you to all who have lovingly helped me out with pronunciations of different words along the way. The second thing I'd like to improve uh, makes sense because this is a video format here on YouTube. I'd like to improve my visuals, not just the look of the video itself, although I would like to improve that, but which at this point I've gotten all the quality I can out of my current devices. But I would like to harness the visual format and get more out of it, creating more visuals. This means I need time to learn how to do video editing and things like that, which who knows when I'm gonna have time for that because I'd always rather read. I definitely wanna improve bookshelf tours. A lot of you have been getting after me because of how long it's been since a bookshelf tour, and I apologize for that, but I'm just, I can't get the quality that I want out of it. It seems so unsatisfactory with all the shakiness and trying to make it virtualize, virtualize? simulate you actually perusing my shelves while also juggling all of my equipment and so on. And I don't know, I, I just, uh, maybe I need to get over it and just put it out there in the quality that it is, but I really want to improve that experience, make it more, make it smoother and more realistic for you. Audience engagement is something I would really like to focus on. Again, this comes down to time. But I just, I love interacting with you all so much and I try my best to stay on top of the comments and things like that. But I would like to get more, both, both ways, you know, more, I'm not talking about more likes and stuff like that, but more like engagement between us, the two of us. And I would like to do more coverage of short stories and poetry and nonfiction. None of these get the attention of novels fictional novels. Eh, that was kind of redundant. But nonetheless, I feel like if I could, I would like to help foster more interest in how to get more out of reading short stories and poetry and bring in some really interesting nonfiction that I feel has really made reading my fiction better. Coffee sip break. Oh, I forgot it was an affogato. I'm used to just black coffee only. That is a treat. All right, five books I discovered from this channel, or five great books I discovered through this channel. Too Loud a Solitude by Bohumil Khorabal, Blinding by Mircea Cartarescu, and congratulations, Mircea Cartarescu and Sean Cotter on the Dublin Literary Award for Solenoid. Sickle by Ruth Lilligraven, Old Rendering Plant by Wolfgang Hilbig, and Shakespeare's Dog by Leon Rook. This one was brought to my attention by Matt Booker when I was a guest on his and Dave Laird's show, The Concavity Show. So thank you for this, Matt Booker. My five favorite videos has to start with Mason and Dixon by Thomas Pinchon. This was not only just so, it's so much fun to read and just hits on every level, but the video was so much fun to put together. And then it's really funny if you watch it, the sun as it's coming through my windows, is like eclipsing my face 
and you can watch it throughout the course of the video as it takes over my face more and more and I'm trying to keep my eyes out of it. And I, I really wish I had somehow connected that to the book itself because it felt so apt. Blinding again was such a fun video and it was my discovery of Carturescu. Thank you to Luca in Italy for bringing this to my attention because this is what caused me to be a Carturescu fan. The Passion According to GH by Clarice Lispector. This was my first Clarice Lispector and it just, wow, what an experience. And I enjoyed making that video because it allowed me to make a doodle that I think, if I recall, I showed it to the camera very closely. In the course of reading that particular section, which gave rise to that doodle, it just made the, the making of, of this video stick with me. La Medusa by Vanessa Place. This was part of my Los Angeles series of books I read in preparation for my first time in Los Angeles, but reading this was amazing. This was a really Joycean experience. I had a lot of fun thinking about how I would even talk about this book. And last but not least, in my five favorite videos on the channel, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. And thank you to Paper Bird for making that video and that April Fool's Day so great. Five books that I really, really, really want to make a video on, but for some reason haven't yet, begins with Pale Fire by Vladimir Nabokov. I think this is my favorite Nabokov. It represents everything that is great about his writing. I've talked all around it in various videos, but I need to make a video specifically dedicated to this great book. Moby Dick, Herman Melville. I, as I've talked about, along with several others, Shakespeare, Faulkner, Borges, which I finally do have Borges on the channel, there's just something so personal for me about this book, which is my favorite American novel, by the way, if you don't know, that it's almost something akin to irreverence or sacrilege to make a video about it, but it's gotta happen. Plus it's part of my Western Core series, so it's gonna happen. And like I just said, Faulkner, The Sound and the Fury, also Absalom, Absalom, but definitely The Sound and the Fury is one that is really close to me and that I would love to make a video on. House of Leaves, which is again, a very personal, sentimentally attached book. It was the book that I was reading in the hospital while we were there for the occasion of my daughter's birth. Plus it was just totally unlike anything I had ever read. And finally, the KJV Bible. I've been wanting to talk, do videos on the Bible. I've even thought about a separate channel called Verse by Verse or something like that to just talk about the Bible and things related to the Bible. All right, here are five clarifications I'd like to make. Number one, I no longer read for four hours a day. Back when I started the channel, I was reading for four hours a day. And a lot of that reason, I think, goes back to the fact that at that time, somehow, my metabolism was still working in my favor, and I just was a lot more naturally healthy. But now, somehow, in these particular five years, maybe I've been reading more <laughs> than I was even before, but suddenly, I have a need to exercise very regularly. So for the last couple of years, or maybe about the last year for sure, I exercise a lot more every day. So that cuts down on it. Plus, as my daughter has started to elevate in grades at school, she needs my presence, my attention, my input. She needs me to be there more. And so, you know, I would burn all these books to the ground to do anything for my daughter. So between being healthy, <laughs> exercising, and being a better dad, it's more like about two hours a day, with some exceptions. I mean, there are some Saturdays where I'll sit and read for six hours straight before we go out and do things. But for the, the average, it's now two hours a day, not four hours a day. I really did read those first four Karl Ava Knusgård books in the My Struggle series 
in two evenings. Now, what I think I failed to mention was that this was me beginning reading like right after dinner and then reading into the wee hours. Also, at that particular time that I was reading them, I was very tuned in because I was fascinated with the lives, the humdrum everyday lives of writers. And those books really give that insight. And I mean, I was just fastened to those books. But I, and I really did. I read the first four. I think I said that in my 10 book, 10 big books I love or something like that. And I've caught so much heat for that. But I mean, I have no reason to lie. Now, the fifth and especially the six books were nowhere near that pace. But it happened. In one of my early Q&A videos, I did indeed blunder on the continent related question. I can't exactly remember what it was like your favorite author from each continent. I tried to make what I thought was a, a clever joke about Europe and England and Ireland and Russia and the nebulousness of what was Europe, what wasn't Europe. And I had in my mind a friend of mine from Newcastle who would always look at me in disgust if I referred to him as a European. And I tried to package all these up and it, it, the joke didn't come off and I just looked mm, ignorant instead. But yeah, I totally blundered. That philosophy video that really took off quite unexpectedly. I wish that I had clarified at the time that that was specifically Western philosophy because I've gotten a lot of heat about this is this list is so incomplete. It's only one half of the world, all that kind of stuff. And the reason it is is because I'm extremely ignorant of Eastern philosophy. I do plan to start reading more and discovering Eastern philosophy. And eventually I'll be able to supplement that video with the Eastern part and then maybe do one on global philosophy or something, I don't know. But I would like to clarify that that was intended to be my personal recommendations for Western philosophy. Oh, and Michael Silverblatt did indeed interview Sheila Hetty for her book, Pure Color. In my video earlier this year on Pure Color, I mentioned about the fact that he called me, he was so excited about this book that he said, this is a masterpiece. And for some reason, in the melee of everything that would unfold from there and the unfortunate circumstances of his sickness and him being hospitalized here and then helping him get back to Los Angeles somewhere along the way, I missed that before he left to come here, he did do a recording with Sheila Hetty. So people pointed that out to me and I'm so thankful because I was able to go back and enjoy that. that just somehow I totally missed that. Five videos I wish I could redo. Number one that springs to mind is my Robert Musil, The Man Without Qualities. I thought I was being so clever. You know, a lot of my blunders start with me thinking I'm being clever, but I, since the novel's unfinished, famously unfinished, I thought, oh, what if I played Schubert's Unfinished Symphony? The problem is that I was literally playing it out of computer speakers while my dinky old point and shoot camera microphone was picking it up plus my voice. So they can't be removed. They're intertwined in the same track and the volume couldn't be controlled. So, oh, it's awful. You can hear me raising my voice, trying to get above the loud parts of the symphony. And yeah, I, I just, I apologize for that. It's very distracting. My video on the poetry of Atzer O'Reilly, which if you haven't read the poetry of Atzer O'Reilly, but you love the sonic element, the audible dimension of language, man, this is a serious treat. I thought I was being clever. <laughs> and I decided at the last minute to add subtitles because a lot of the words that you'll encounter, at least for me, were really novel almost exotic. And I wanted people to see what I was saying. Well, because I did this at the last minute and I was so hasty about it, uh, I got things wrong. I actually even said things wrong, like read them off of the page incorrectly. There are discrepancies between those subtitles and what I'm saying. Atzer O'Reilly himself watched the video and called it out. And I, I just, I still feel horrible about that. But at that point, it was already in the wild. Lots of people were already responding and yeah, I'll never do that again. Or if I do, I'll just delay posting it instead of being so hasty.
and get it right. Holy the Firm, Annie Diller. This is one of my absolute favorite little books. I read off of an essay while holding the book in front of the camera. It's an older video, but it's just the quality is really bad. And I just had several blunders. I would also love to redo my William T. Volman video. It, <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's an early video with my old, old camera, but these different shots that I tried to do, I guess I was trying to change things up. You know, I was feeling things out. My head's cut off for most of the video, but it's out there. Plus, I just have a lot more to say about his work now. And then the other one that I would like to redo is the 10 big books I love because I really don't say anything about them. But then again, at that time, I honestly did not expect more than a few people to watch these videos. All right, now five low viewed videos that, and for, for that, I used a criterion of less than 200 views. So five low viewed videos on books that I think are hidden gems. The Desert and Its Seed by Jorge Baron Biza. I honestly can't believe this isn't more talked about. The Way of Florida by Russell Pearson, which is actually coming back into, a, into print and actually into print in America for the first time, so stay tuned for that. Melville by Jean Giono. The Poetry of Lucy Brock Broido. Outstanding, beautiful poetry. And last year's subscriber wildcard pick, Trends Relating House One by Pupe Misagi. Five authors I would love to interview on the new Author Talks series. Number one, William T. Volman, Marilyn Robinson, Ann Carson, Thomas Pinchon, and Mircea Cartarescu. My five favorite words. The only reason, that, or the only criteria I use for this was to sit and think, what words come up in my mind all the time? And why do they? And what I traced them all back to was they're just fun to say. And these are words that I learned long ago and they just stuck because for some reason their sound quality and the way they feel saying just are really satisfying. But the first one is Bosphorus. And then Quinceanera, Punctilious, Balayage, which is actually my most recent one that I learned because I've got a daughter who's getting interested in getting her hair styled and colored. And I learned from my own stylist the term balayage. And it's just so much fun to say, balayage. And then this isn't really a word, but it's the name of a character from, I think, Darkwing Duck, but Tusker Nini. That's, I say that all the time, Tusker Nini. <laughs> Ever since the first time I heard it, it just really stuck. Five books still woefully on my TBR. The Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. This is one I've poked at for at least 15 years. Just poked at it, read the first couple of pages, read all about it one day. Plutarch's Lives, the lives of the noble Grecians and Romans. Women and Men by Joseph McElroy. The Art of Memory by Francis Yates. I've started and stopped this one so many times. There's so much to take in. And it's on a topic that really interests me. And so many things that I've read have cited this book. I have no idea why I, I don't know why. And Parallel Stories by Petr Nedas. Five classics still woefully on my TBR. Anthony Powell's A Dance to the Music of Time. Pessoa's the Book of Disquiet. You know, I've talked about this a little bit, but I really practice and enjoy delayed gratification when it comes to reading. And it's almost like this is one of those books, along with Women and Men, that I just know I'm going to connect with and enjoy so much that I, I'm delaying that gratification because I'm enjoying keeping the desire for them alive. The Story of the Stone. And I haven't been tutored on how to pronounce this name, so I'll choose not to. Tasso's Jerusalem Delivered. And The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. This is another one that I've started and stopped innumerable times. Five books I wish I could read in the original language. Number one, the Hebrew Bible. Number two, the Iliad in Homeric Greek. Three, the Georgics in Classical Latin. The Tale of Genji in Japanese and Bottom's Dream in the original German. Five books I wish I could rediscover. 
Le Tombeau de Mecho in praise of the music of language, which was, I think, my second or third video on this channel by Douglas R. Hofstadter. And again from Douglas R. Hofstadter, Gerda Escher Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid. This was, again, either my second or third video. Or maybe I did the two together, sort of. I don't think I did a, very, a video specific on this one, maybe. But anyway, these books mean a lot to me. William Gaddis's The Recognitions. This was the edition in which I first read it back when, I mean, I wasn't connected to anybody. I don't even remember how, oh yeah, I do. Jonathan Franzen's essay, How to Be Alone, and he talked about reading The Recognitions. That's how I even found out about it and then just fell in love with it. And this was before, I, I knew nothing about Stephen Moore. I was just blown away by this and I had no one to talk to about it. And Surprised by Joy. C.S. Lewis. This book, which operates somewhat like a memoir for Lewis and talks a lot about his student days and all the, the reading he got to do and studying and things like that, which is always something of interest to me. But this came at a great time in my life and it, he really was able to articulate some things that I had experienced or sensed, but could never even begin to explain. So I'll always be forever grateful that this book exists. Five literary places I would like to visit. First, Athens, Greece, which I do plan on visiting next year, in fact. Also, Paris, which I am visiting this October. La Mancha, Spain, which hopefully is self-explanatory. Dublin, Ireland, and Buenos Aires, Argentina. My five favorite quotes. Poetry heals the wounds inflicted by reason. Novalis. Celebrity is a mask that eats into the face. John Updike. The truth will set you free, but not until it is finished with you. David Foster Wallace. An enemy is someone whose story you have not heard yet. Slavoj Žižek. He might have been quoting somebody, though. I think we ought to read only the kind of books that wound or stab us. If the book we're reading doesn't wake us up with a blow to the head, what are we reading for? A book must be the axe for the frozen sea within us. Kafka. Five best things that have happened to me because of this channel. Meeting Jim Gower and being offered to write the afterword to the second edition of his book, especially with all of the other connections around that that I talked about earlier. Stephen Moore, getting into contact with him, emailing each other, sending him a book for him to autograph, getting his consent to post the unedited version of his talk on the show Bookworm, which actually led me to getting in touch with Michael Silverblatt. Definitely Stephen Moore has been such an influence on my reading and then being able to get in touch with him and share things here and there has been unbelievable. Michael Silverblatt, which I've gone on and on about, I mean, he's another who was a monumental influence and continues to be. There was just never a reader quite like him. And of course, spending so much time talking with him on the phone for a year and then going through a sort of traumatic experience with him. This, you know, of course, uh, was, it's a bittersweet. I went live on behalf of NYRB on NYRB's Instagram channel. This happened back when Tim Yude, the performance artist, was retyping the recognitions. And it was in tandem with NYRB bringing out the recognitions and JR and then eventually the letters. And it was so unfortunate, but they forgot to set it up so that it would save the video and then we could post it. So it streamed and then that was it and it disappeared into the ether. And uh, you know, my parents took some pictures <laughs> and other people sent me screenshots and stuff from where they had tuned in, but that was definitely just a really enjoyable experience. And then just this year, I have been asked to participate as a judge for a literary award. I'm really excited about this. It's called the Republic of Consciousness Award. And what it is is that small presses get to send in their candidates to win and they'll get a pretty good sum of money. I think the last one was something like $35,000, but it's like two lines press, $2 radio, who else? Uh, Transit was on there. 
Dorothy was on there, but I'll participate with a group of other judges and we'll read these books and narrow it down to a long list of 10 and a short list of five and then finally a winner. So I'm really looking forward to that and I'll talk more about that as the year goes on. Five books I really, really enjoyed, but I don't think I've ever even mentioned on the channel. I tried my best to really think about if I had ever mentioned them. So I think I'm right that I haven't. Daniel Quinn's Ishmael. Little Big by John Crowley, or Crowley. Excellent book. The Conspiracy Against the Human Race by Thomas Ligotti, which is really sort of an outlier of reading for me. And I read this a long, long, long time ago. I think I read it, I think it's a philosophy. It's considered philosophy, maybe. And it's nonfiction in any case, but I read this around the time that I read In the Dust of This Planet by Eugene Thacker. I can't remember if Thacker refers to him or if I looked up other books like In the Dust of This Planet, but in any case, even though it's kind of a darker read, more pessimistic read, this really stands out to me still. Coffee break. Gods Among Gazelles by Peter Damien Bellis. This is actually the same guy who wrote The Mad Patagonian. I was blown away by the level of prose in this book. Highly recommended. I really need to do a video on it, honestly. And The Heart is a Lonely Hunter by Carson McCullers. I love Carson McCullers. The very first thing I read of hers was The Member of the Wedding, and then I read some short stories, and then I finally read this one. As I do, I, I tend, sometimes tend to shy away from the most popular books of a given author and, or, or save them for last, such as Women and Men with... Joseph McElroy, same thing I did with Saving Darkenville's Cat to the end of Alexander Theroux. This is just such a beautiful book. Don't let its popularity put you off. All right, the next list was fun because I got to look through over 3,300 book covers. And I actually looked through them twice to select my top five favorite cover art. Number one is Adam Levin's Bubblegum, which also happens to be a book that I cherish and one that smells like bubblegum. The second one is Compass by Matthias Enard. Just what New Directions has great, great design. Middle C by William H. Gass. I mean, how, how perfect is that? It's just perfect. I'm a sucker for this kind of stuff. The Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. This is from Seven Stories Press. Oh, Seven Stories. Forgot to mention you. Sorry about that. And from Shocken, the aphorisms of Kafka. All right, I can't believe it, but we are already at the end. This is the 20th list of five. And it is my five favorite notes on type. The note on type in the back of the eyelid by S.D. Krastovska out from Coach House Books says typeset in Arno. Printed at the Coach House on BP Nickel Lane in Toronto, Ontario on Zephyr Antique Laid Paper, which was manufactured acid-free in St. Jérôme, Quebec from Second Growth Forests. This book was printed with vegetable-based ink on a 1973 Heidelberg cord offset litho press. Its pages were folded on a baum folder gathered by hand, bound on a Solby auto minibinder, and trimmed on a polar single knife cutter. I am a sucker for details like that. Next, Life, a user's manual by Georges Perec. And it says, Life, a user's manual, has been set in Minion, a type design by Robert Slimbach in 1990. An offshoot of the designer's researches during the development of Adobe Garamond, Minion hybridized the characteristics of numerous Renaissance sources into a single calligraphic hand. Unlike many faces developed exclusively for digital typesetting, drawings for Minion were transferred to the computer early in the de design phase, preserving much of the freshness of the original concept. Conceived with an eye toward overall harmony, its capitals, lowercase, and numerals were carefully balanced to maintain a well-groomed family appearance, both between Roman and Italic, and across the full range of weights. A decidedly contemporary face, Minion makes free use of the qualities Slimbach found most appealing in the types of the 15th and 16th centuries. Crisp drawing and a narrow set width make Minion an economical and easygoing book type. 
and even its name reflects its adaptable, affable, and almost self-effacing nature, referring as it does to a small size of type, a faithful or devoted servant, and a kind of peach. <laughs> Perfume by Patrick Suskind. This book was set on the linotype in Jensen, a recutting made direct from type cast from matrices long thought to have been made by the Dutchman Anton Jensen, who was a practicing type founder in Leipzig during the years 1668 to 1687. However, it has been conclusively demonstrated that these types are actually the work of Nicholas Kiss, or Kish, 1650 to 1702, a Hungarian who most probably learned his trade from the master Dutch type founder, Dirk Voskens. It's like a whole mystery wrapped into a note on type. The type is an excellent example of the influential and sturdy Dutch types that prevailed in England up to the time William Caslin, 1692 to 1766, developed his own incomparable designs from them. The Last and the First by I. Compton Burnett, which this was a gift from George Salas. Thank you so much. This book was set in monotype Calson, which we just read about. A modern adaptation of a type designed by the first William Calson. I'm saying Calson, it's Caslin. 1692 to 1766. The Caslin face has had two centuries of ever-increasing popularity in the United States. It is of interest to note that the first copies of the Declaration of Independence and the first paper currency distributed to the citizens of the newborn nation were printed in this typeface. How stately. The Daimo Nose, one of the later works by Harold Bloom. This book was set in Saban, a typeface designed by the well-known German typographer Jan Chischold. Saban's design is based upon the original letter forms of 16th century French type designer Claude Garamond and was created specifically to be used for three sources, foundry type for hand composition, linotype, and monotype. Chischold named his typeface for the famous Frankfurt type founder Jacques Saban. And finally, The Fractalist, the memoir by Mandelbrot. This book was set in Monotype Dante, a typeface designed by Giovanni Mandersteeg. Conceived as a private type for the Officina Bodani in Verona, Italy, Dante was originally cut only for hand composition by Charles Melan, the famous Parisian punch cutter, between 1946 and 1952. Its first use was in an edition of Boccaccio's Trattatello in Laude di Dante that appeared in 1954. The Monotype Corporation's version of Dante followed in 57. Although modeled on the Aldine type used for Pietro Cardinal Bembo's treatise De Itna in 1495, Dante is a thoroughly modern interpretation of the venerable face. If you don't spend time flipping to the very, very back of your books to see if there is a note on type, and then furthermore, read these, and always read them with a, an air of haute couture, you know, fanciful, high class, okay, snootiness, then you're really missing out on a treat. All right, well, that's it. Thank you for sitting here and celebrating with me on the five-year anniversary of this channel, five years of Leaf by Leaf in 20 five item lists. I hope you enjoyed them. Let me know what you think. And here's to five more years. Thank you all so much for your support and especially all of your generous and kind and often very informative feedback. I wish you all the best. Here's to five more years.